Good morning. Welcome to Sky News Breakfast. Thank you for joining us. The supervisor of the former police officer accused of murdering George Floyd has told the court the restraint of Mr Floyd should have stopped when he'd been handcuffed and was no longer offering any resistance. The trial has also been hearing from Mr Floyd's girlfriend, who described how they'd met at a Salvation Army shelter. Derek Chauvin has pleaded not guilty to murder and manslaughter charges. Our US correspondent Greg Milam reports. I do. Courtney Ross had been in a relationship with George Floyd for nearly three years by the time he died. May I tell the story? Sure. OK. Uh, it's one of my favourite stories. They'd met when he worked as a security guard at the Salvation Army shelter. <laughs> he said, um... He said, well, can I pray with you? It was so sweet. <laughs> and at the time... Both, though, developed addictions to opioids during their relationship. The lawyer for Derek Chauvin asked her about taking George Floyd to hospital two months before his death. You spent several days with him at the hospital, correct? Yes. And did you learn what, that, what caused that overdose? No. At that time frame, did you learn that Mr. Floyd was taking anything other than opioids? No. You, you did not know that he had taken heroin at that time? No. Two weeks before his death, she said she became aware he was using opioids again. I noticed a change in his behaviour, yes. The defence claimed George Floyd died of a drugs overdose, not as the result of the force of a police officer's knee on his neck for nine minutes. The jury heard from paramedics who said they felt George Floyd was already dead when they arrived. And they heard Derek Chauvin talking to his supervisor uh, really straight crazy, after. I had to hold the guy down. He was, uh, was uh, <clears throat> going crazy. He wasn't going uh, enough at the moment. He never mentioned kneeling on George Floyd's neck. His former colleague was asked if that would be considered excessive force. And is the placement of a knee on a subject's neck uh, a use of force? Yes. A, a reportable type of force? Not necessarily. Okay. And why is that? Uh, for handcuffing somebody in a prone position or fighting with someone, it could happen where your knee ends up on their neck. Okay. For about how long? I, I guess whatever is reasonable. Okay. And which would be when? Uh, until you get control of the party, I guess. Okay. Control is in the person is then handcuffed? Handcuffed and not continuing to fight with you anymore. Okay. So. Once the person, once the subject is handcuffed and no longer resisting? Yes. At that point, uh, the restraint should stop. Yeah. It's been an exhaustive, at times graphic examination of the events of that day. Difficult for everyone involved and a country watching intently. Greg Milam, Sky News, Minneapolis. And Sky News will have continuous coverage of proceedings in the trial of Derek Chauvin, streaming live on our website and app, on YouTube and on a special pop-up channel, which is pin-protected on Sky Channel 524. At least 34 people have died after a train derailed inside a tunnel in Taiwan. More than 70 others have been injured, with rescue services struggling to reach parts of the train. Our Asia correspondent Tom Cheshire joins me now. Tom, what, what's the situation uh, at the moment and what more do we know about exactly what happened? We know this train derailed around 9am on the east of Taiwan. It is uh, coming up to Tomb Sweeping Day, which is a big holiday when lots of people travel. And 350 people were on this train as it made its way through a very mountainous region of Taiwan. It derailed and you can see uh, some people, of course, have made it out pretty much unharmed, but at least 30 dead and many more still trapped inside. Uh, what appears to have happened is the train hit uh, some sort of vehicle, uh, potentially a cargo truck or a service vehicle, uh, which obviously shouldn't have been there on the rails. And that uh, caused the carriages to uh, scrape against the wall. It's crumpled them, it's ripped them apart. And that's also making the rescue effort but very difficult. It's inside this tunnel. Um, so they are trying to get those people out. Um, those confirmed deaths already make it 
the worst train crash in Taiwan for decades. In 2018, there was a crash where 18 people died. In 91, another crash where 30 people died. So this uh, has already surpassed those horrible totals. Um, and they will be trying to get those people out for the rest of it. Uh, this is a high speed train. It's a very, very safe network. Things like this aren't supposed to happen. And obviously that vehicle was not supposed to be in the way. Uh, but rescue services, as you can see there, trying their best to reach those carriages in the middle of the tunnel, those crumpled carriages, and see if they can reach the people still trapped inside and see whether they can still be saved. Tom, thank you for that update. More than 70 MPs, including 40 Conservatives, say plans to use coronavirus vaccine passports in the UK will be divisive and discriminatory. Boris Johnson says there will definitely be a role for the passports for Britons to head abroad. And there are suggestions they could be trialled at some pilot events. Well, according to the Institute for Government, the passports are most likely to be available via a mobile app or the existing general NHS app. Verification could be sought from facial recognition or integration with NHS medical records. A government review is considering whether a vaccine passport could allow visitors entry to venues such as pubs, theatres and sports stadiums. Interim results are due on Monday. Israel has so far moved furthest with vaccine passports. Green passes are valid a week after a second vaccine dose and allow people to use leisure facilities like hotels and gyms. Let's get more from our political correspondent, Rob Powell. Um, they've been discussed uh, quite, quite a bit, uh, vaccine passports, but with more than 70 MPs warning against them, how likely are they to be brought in? Well, I think it depends, um, Gillian, on a number of factors. I guess one is whether they want to make it... Uh, give it a legal underpinning, if you like, write it into law requirements to have vaccine passports. If that was the case, you'd need to have legislation going through the House of Commons and then the government could run into trouble, especially if Labour um, are opposed to it. Um, I, I think the other issue really for Boris Johnson to consider is what circumstances he plans to use these sorts of certificates for. I think for international travel, there's little controversy about that and acceptance that other countries will ask for certain proofs um, before you're allowed into the country. It starts to get more sticky when you're talking about getting into everyday services um, like shops, like pubs, as Boris Johnson had suggested in relation to pubs. That is what these 70 MPs, 40 of them Conservatives, but plenty of Labour MPs, people like Jeremy Corbyn that have signed this pledge as well. They say that they don't want the use of COVID certificates uh, to essentially block people off from getting into everyday business, being part of their community or, or getting jobs um, as well. I think the other big factor that the government will have to consider is what's the alternative? How else can you prove that you're safe if you haven't had the vaccine because you can't have it or because you don't want to have it? And that was something that Boris Johnson touched on uh, on a visit to Teesside yesterday. I think when it comes to trying to make sure that we give maximum confidence to business and to, to customers and uh, here in the, in the UK, there are, uh, there are, there are three things. There's your, your immunity, uh, whether you've had it before, so whether you've got natural antibodies anyway, whether you've been vaccinated, and then, of course, whether you've had a test. And so those three things working together will, I think, uh, be useful for us as we, as we go forward. Now, we know there's going to be a number of pilot events running in the next month or so, some FA Cup uh, matches, also the World Snooker Championship at the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield, where people attending will be tested before and after, uh, and interactions, if you like, the results of that will be studied by experts to see how to safely reopen sporting events. Um, the Daily Mail and the Daily Telegraph reporting this morning that vaccine passports, vaccine certification could also play a role in those pilots. Uh, now, overnight, the government not confirming anything and saying this is all subject to an ongoing review. We should get the first interim results of that on Monday. OK, Rob, thank you. Other stories making the news this morning and police have issued warnings against people gathering over the Easter weekend with several kill the bill protests being organised. The Metropolitan Police says it will take enforcement action if needed in the interests of public health. A number of protests against the proposed police crime sentencing and courts bill have ended in violence. Police in Belgium have used water cannon to try to disperse a crowd of thousands of young people who'd gathered in one of the biggest parks in Brussels despite coronavirus restrictions. 
The party had been advertised on social media and around 2,000 people turned up. Another event has been advertised for tonight. Oxfam has confirmed it has suspended two members of staff in the Democratic Republic of Congo over allegations of sexual misconduct and bullying. The charity previously faced complaints in 2018 after further allegations of sexual exploitation by aid workers in response to the 2010 Haiti earthquake. Oxfam said they're working hard to conclude the investigation fairly safely and effectively. There's fresh doubt being cast on the safety of smart motorways. An independent report has found that drivers are 200% more likely to break down on a live motorway lane if they're on a smart motorway, which has no hard shoulder. And it says that when they do break down, they're more likely to die. The report was commissioned by lawyers representing the widow of a man who died on a smart section of the M1. Milena Vasilinovic reports. Claire Mercer's husband, Jason, was a colourful and loving person, she says. Nearly two years ago, he and another driver were killed in the section of the M1 motorway without a hard shoulder. They had a minor shunt and pulled into the left lane, but minutes later, a lorry ploughed into them. When I opened my door to two police officers, I just, I just froze and I just, I started with the worst case scenario, thinking anything they say could only be an improvement, and I just said, is he alive? And after pushing, they wanted me to go in, but I, I just couldn't move. I said it again and they said no, and I fell to the floor. They, they had to pick me up. The lorry driver was jailed for 10 months, but Claire Mercer believes her husband would still be alive if there was a hard shoulder. And a coroner in the inquest into his death said it was clear that its absence contributed to the tragedy. Some motorways like this one behind me don't have a hard shoulder where motorists can pull up if they have an accident. Instead, the entire carriageway is open to traffic in order to reduce congestion. And the lane is only shut once there's an accident. An independent report commissioned by Claire Mercer's lawyers says this makes the roads more risky. It found that motorways where all lanes are running are associated with the highest rate of people killed or seriously injured. Fundamentally, in all lane running motorways, we have a motorway which is less safe now than the original smart motorways. And as a result, people are dying or being seriously injured on those roads. In terms of the decision making that has led to this point, the evidence suggests that those decisions have been underpinned by evidence which is incomplete and which hasn't really made those decisions fully informed. Highways England said that they are reviewing the report. In a statement they wrote, the government's evidence stock take of the safety of smart motorways analysed a wealth of data and found that in most ways they are as safe as or safer than conventional motorways. We are committed to delivering the stock take actions to further raise the bar on smart motorway safety. For Claire Mercer, there's no relief from the pain of losing her husband. I still expect him to, to walk through the door. Um, the only thing that tells me that it is real is he still keeps not coming home. So uh, you, just, you just don't get used to it. Her wish now is to make the road safer for others. Milena Veselinovic, Sky News. Well, joining me now is the president of the AA, Edmund King. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, before we talk about the, the safety, um, what exactly are smart motorways and what are the different types? Yes, smart motorways were first introduced around 2006 and the first was on the M42 in the West Midlands. And what that was, it used the hard shoulder as a live running lane when it was congested. And that worked quite well because there were emergency laybys every 500 metres, there were overhead gantries. So if there was a problem, most people could get to an emergency layby. Then what happened after 2006, they were rolled out to other motorways, the M25, the M1, et cetera. But then the criteria changed. So rather than having emergency refuges at 500 metres, the regulation changed to 2,500 metres or a mile and a half. And that's when problems started because people breaking down could not get to that emergency refuge area. Now, some of them are all lane running. And what that means is that the hard shoulder is a live lane all of the time, 24 hours a day. Others are what they call a dynamic hard shoulder, and the hard shoulder is only used as a live running lane when it's busy. 
And this has also led to confusion. But, you know, the main sticking point really has been the 38% of people who break down on a live motorway, on a smart motorway, in a live lane. And we put that down to the lack of these emergency refuge areas, which means in many cases, people, frankly, have got nowhere to go. Essentially, the question is, smart motorways in their, their current form, do you believe that they're safe? In their current form, we don't believe they're safe because the whole thing about smart motorways is that they were meant to have technology to make them safe. So they were meant to have a stop vehicle detection system that if a vehicle did break down in a live lane, it would be spotted. But that was not rolled out at the same time. There was only 23 miles on the M25 that had that radar system and a small sec section now on the M3. They are looking at rolling that out, but there still are questions. So th this report that's just come, come out actually adds more questions and it actually talks about a safe system. In, in any engineering, you actually have to engineer in for human error. You know, if things go wrong, how does the system work? And this report suggests that that was not done at all in the early years. And I think that, that is a, a grave concern. Um, I mean, I was, this, sorry, sorry to interrupt, we're running out of time, but, sure. but it's going to be very worrying for people listening, hearing you, President of the AA, saying that they're not safe. And as we speak, there are people driving on these smart motorways. Well, indeed, and um, we, we've been talking about this for 10 years and we've put proposals to the government to make them much safer. And this report and four coroners say that. So, you know, for drivers, make sure your car's in good, good condition. Try and prevent breaking down on a smart motorway. And if you can, don't stop. Drive the extra mile to the ERA, drive to the exit. And if you do break down in a live lane and cannot get out on the inside lane, the advice is put your hazard lights on, keep your seatbelt on and dial 999. It, it is that serious. Edmund King, President of the AA, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us and uh, handing out that advice. Thank you. Let's take a look at the weather for you now with uh, Joe. What have you got? A surprise, I think, for most people. <laughs> Unless you've missed surprises. all the press. Well, I mean, of course, this last week we saw temperatures up to 24, 25 degrees Celsius. It looked like summer. It felt like summer. The thing is, it wasn't summer. Uh, we have got quite a quiet weekend, but then the cold air returns Monday, Tuesday. Bitterly cold. Showers of hail, sleet and snow. Strong northerly winds as well. And that cold air is with us for a few days yet. Let's take a look at the weekend, though. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, it's actually quite a quiet start for this Good Friday. Uh, plenty of sunshine out towards the west, although it's cold. Temperatures have dipped below freezing in some parts of the northwest. A little bit more cloudy out towards the east, and that's very much going to be the way things are over the next uh, couple of days. So lovely sunshine through uh, much of Scotland, Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest. This cloud through central, southern, southeastern areas will thin and break to allow some sunny spells, but it's breezier here as well, and those temperatures will be knocked back into single figures. Whereas out towards the west, we could see 13 or 14 degrees Celsius. That's 57 degrees Fahrenheit. And then uh, as we go through this evening and overnight, that cloud starts to come back, but we expect a frost in the northwest. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Well, let's return to the news that the government could soon trial vaccine passports at some pilot events. We're joining you now is uh, Silky Carlo, the director of Big Brother Watch. Good morning to you. Um, initially, what, what are your thoughts on the proposals of uh, vaccination passports and their use? I think this is a really, really troubling idea. It's um, unnecessary. We've got a fantastic vaccination programme. We should be coming out of this crisis. It's unworkable and it's un-British. You know, we're not a nation that lives on licence. We're not a nation that carries ID cards. And frankly, the idea of carrying COVID passes, which is like an ID card on steroids, you know, immediately would hold very sensitive 
health data to try to implement a, a segregation policy. I mean, we haven't seen anything like this in, in Britain for decades. Is very, very troubling. This should be a moment for optimism. And instead, I think we find ourselves on the precipice of a, a serious civil liberties war. The, the idea isn't to implement a segregation policy, though, is it? it? It's to allow people to be able to operate and go about their, their daily business and, and access services and to, to protect each other. Well, the, the point of it is to prevent some people from accessing services. And that means some people are going to be denied tickets that they've paid for or jobs that they have. This is all about segregation. It's all about exclusion. And the, uh, the government is going about this in exactly the wrong way. If, as everyone wants to, you know, there's, there's a common goal here. Everyone wants to come out of lockdown and for everyone to be healthy, safe and free. You don't do that by excluding people. You don't do that by creating a digital surveillance infrastructure that's designed to exclude the most marginalised people. Um, and it, it also including people who are unable to have a vaccine or don't have access um, to, to healthcare as easily as others. We're talking about minority of people, but for example, how, what would the situation be for pregnant women who routinely aren't offered vaccination at the moment? I mean, how long are people going to be expected to show their papers? My, one of my fears is that once such an extreme policy and such an extreme system like this is introduced, we will never see the back of it. And it would only expand and expand into other health issues, other use cases that would turn us into a very, very different society indeed. What, what would you propose instead by means of uh, allowing people to, to lead full lives and access services, as I said before? Well, the, 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 what we really need is for everyone to be safe at a community level. Um, and that's the only sensible way in which things can start to reopen, which, frankly, I think should be happening right now. It should be happening very soon um, because the vaccination programme is going very well. Um, and we're seeing very, very high uptake as well. So the, the most vulnerable people are, are broadly now protected. So we need to see on, ongoing measures, protections at work, et cetera, to make sure that people are safe. And then really good contact tracing so that you can, you don't need to treat the whole population as though they're infectious. You can actually track infections. And let's remember, Dido Harding, head of Test and Trace, has 37 billion pounds to spend on test and trace. And as par uh, parliamentary committees have said, we're not really seeing the returns on that. Where the money is being spent is where we should be seeing um, people now being kept safer and us being in a situation where we can reopen. Not that we need to turn into some kind of discriminatory dystopia where anyone from bosses to bouncers can demand your papers, create two queues at football games or at pubs and tell people that they're not allowed in. That is not in any, in a democratic society, that's not a sensible way forward. OK, Silky Carlo, director of Big Brother Watch, thank you for sharing your views with us. Definitely against uh, the introduction of vaccination passports there. Still to come, we have all of the sport with Jackie. What have you got coming up? For a lot us? of food. I'm going Ooh, to be talking about food. Don't. I can't stop thinking about food, actually, because it's Easter. Um, we're going to tell you what's on Dustin Johnson's menu for the Masters dinner. It's delicious. Uh, also, is former Premier League boss Eddie Howe on verge of a return to football management eight months after leaving Bournemouth? And could Super League champion St Helens start their title defence with two wins from two at Hull KR? Do social media platforms do enough to curb uh, media abuse of footballers and sports stars? Arsenal think not. Let's have a look. Uh, I think it is sort of like an American apple crumble anyway. This is Sky News Breakfast coming up. Ready to roll. We speak to the 89-year-old hoping to raise money for a charity by skating round a courtyard. There he is. <laughs> Now, inspiration is passing around the country, exemplified by energetic pensioners determined to raise money for good causes by showing the rest of us how to get active. 89-year-old Dr John Wilcox set out to raise £500 for food poverty charity Fair Share on his Just Giving page. 
but he's already gained more than £28,000. And I'm pleased to say Dr John joins me now from Warwick. Good morning to you. Um, so tell us exactly what the challenge is that, that you've taken up. Yes. Uh, what I'm trying to do is roller skate round the courtyard here uh, for 90 laps. That represents 90, or oh, one lap for every year of my life. I'll be 90 in January. So 90 laps for 90 years. Sir Tom Moore did 100 laps for 100 years. He did it with his trolley. I'm going to do it with my trolley, but with the addition of uh, roller skates. Well, well, happy birthday to you when it does arrive, but why roller skates? Well, it would be easy to walk. And in any case, I quite like roller skating, or I did in my younger days. Uh, I haven't skated for 70 years and I'm a bit rusty, but it's all coming back. Now, I, I roller skated when I was younger as well. Um, I wouldn't attempt to get into a pair of roller skates now. It's not that easy to um, actually manage roller skating. Oh, dear. I think we've lost Dr. John Wilcock there. Ah, oh, and he, he was just going to tell me about uh, his roller skating um, prowess and where... Oh, have we got him back? Have we got yes. him back? Are you back with us, yes, Dr. I John? Am. Oh, lovely. Yep. Oh, yes, I was just saying that, you know, I didn't find roller skating particularly easy myself. How have you managed to, to master it? It's been so many years since you put on a pair of roller skates. Well, that's right. It started when I was in the RAF, stationed in Croma in North Norfolk. And uh, I was 19, and it was a good way to meet young ladies, uh, plenty of them around. And to get really close, you had to learn to dance. And I was quite good at roller skating and dancing at the same time. So that's how it all began. And I think once you've learned to ride a bike, it's, uh, it's bound to come back again. So, uh, uh, so a, a good way to, to meet young ladies, you say. Are you planning on doing that now? Well, um, I'm a bit short of time, really. I don't have much time left. I better go on with it if, uh, if I'm going to. <laughs> Are you a little bit worried, though? Because it's, it's a little bit dangerous, isn't it? Well, that's right. What, skating? Oh. Yes. Uh, I, I wear... I mean, I don't know really whether you can see this. I've got elbow pads on and I've got knee pads on. I've got my crash helmet on. So it's all taken care of. Oh. Uh, I'm not expecting to do any crash diving. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but, you, but you've got the helmet on just in case. <laughs> you can never be too careful. You can never right. be too careful. Now, tell us a little bit about your training, because you've been training on something called a, a rollator with a, with a walking aid. That's been well, put that's, together specially for you? No, no, that's, that's a standard uh, a walking aid. That's the thing that Sir Tom used to get around his courtyard. There's plenty of them around. My wife, it belongs to my wife. That's it there in front of me in that picture. Uh, and that's it there. I yes. just read, without it, I can't skate. I just fall flat on my back. So, yeah, you've got you to keep a firm grip of, uh, of that, haven't you? Um, so tell right. us about the... Tell us about the charity that, that you're raising the money for. Yes, I came across that through, through the work of Marcus Rushford, the, the footballer, when he set about his campaign to, to make free school meals available for children during the holiday. Uh, when I was a kid, we were a bit strapped for cash, and I, I know what it's like to go to school hungry, and I enjoyed free school dinners. So, and I, I looked him up on the internet and I found that he was associated with a charity called Fair Share, which is a, a charity that rescues food from supermarkets at the end of the day when it would normally be thrown out because it would, it's out of date. It would then go into, into landfill, causing problems for the environment. They rescue it and redistribute it to needy families. So it's sort of a double bonus, really. Well, a very good cause indeed. Uh, and Dr John Wilcock, you, you wanted to raise just £500. You're already at £28,000. So we wish you continued success uh, with your fundraising. 
all up until your 90th birthday. And happy Lovely. birthday in advance. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Makes me ashamed. We should all be doing our bit, no matter the age. Uh, let's take a look at the weather for you now with Joe. Look forward to brighter skies. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Hello there, good morning to you. Well, for much of the weekend, it'll be fine for roller skating, but by the time we get to Monday, maybe you want to be looking at ice skates or potentially skis instead, because it's going to turn very wintry. And this is going to be quite a surprise, given the fact we had temperatures up to 24 degrees Celsius last week. So uh, we've still got a high pressure with us at the moment. So it's very calm, it's very settled, it's dry in most places. Uh, rather more in the way of cloud across central, southern, southeastern areas. That cloud will thin a little and breaks. So we'll see some sunny spells coming through, but always the best of the sunshine up towards the northwest. And here we'll see temperatures up to around 13 or 14 degrees Celsius. That's 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Cooler on those North Sea coasts with an onshore breeze and temperatures really struggling to get higher than around seven or eight Celsius. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It's 7.43, you're watching Sky News Breakfast. Coming up, we'll take a look at the newspapers with the entrepreneur Kate Hardcastle and the former editor of The Daily Star, Dawn Leeson. Do stay with us. Did you know that reducing pollution outside of school can help stop toxic air getting trapped in our classrooms? The weather stays very quiet through today, with northwestern parts saying the best of the sunshine after a chilly start. Temperatures reaching around 13 or 14 degrees Celsius in those sunny western areas. That's 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Central, southern, southeastern areas, always a little more cloudy, but some sunny spells will come through at times. And uh, for most, it's going to be low levels of air pollution, but we could just see isolated patches of moderate air pollution along those eastern coasts. The Air Quality Report, sponsored by Philips Air Purifiers. With us now to take us through the newspapers, entrepreneur Kate Hardcastle and the former editor of The Daily Star, Dawn Neeson. Welcome back to you both. And um, we're starting with the Yorkshire Post, Kate, and you've had a look at this story, um, which is talking about the North-South divide and government contracts. Yes, it's um, particularly focused in the fact that Labour MP Gareth Thomas believes that there's a a procurement bias that procurements that have been over a certain amount of of, of um, contracts have been awarded uh, more more to the southeast in London than uh, anywhere else across the UK, and obviously that leads to issues in terms of the opportunity for organisations out of London and southeast um, being able to be awarded those contracts. Now the government have come back and said they they have absolutely committed to a program of reform, and I think. We've got to see more balance. I started off life up here in Yorkshire um, as a student where I was told there was no way with this accent I could achieve the things I wanted to achieve in my working life. I then worked internationally a lot. And what I saw was that you would always have some extra wealth around capitals in different countries. But studies have shown that this divide, this um, imbalance is is pretty unique to the UK in terms of countries who are um, in the most advanced of economies. It doesn't lend well, does it, for a, a, a kind of tiny postage stamp of an island that we live on. And now I've come back to the north and seen some of the brilliance that is here in industry, technology and beyond. I think we are only our best selves if we do get balance. We're only our best selves if we have much more of a collaborative nature and that we perhaps can get some of the power shift and some of the awareness of just what a, a rich and brilliant country we are in terms of all parts, not just the element that sits around the epicentre in London. Kate, um, we have heard this argument a lot, though, haven't we, about the, the North-South divide? I mean, it seems to have been going on since time immemorial. Um, we, we've had the, um, what was it, George... Osborne's, uh, the Northern Powerhouse, but it's still happening. The, and, there's, and there's a lot of people in the North that aren't quite sure that Northern Powerhouse is everything we need it to be. I think as soon as we stamp something North or South, is it really the approach we want to take? Surely it's got to be about making sure 
the right people are in the room. We get diversity of every single part of our lives, include ge geographic region. It's so important that we get rid of the snobbery that there might be in terms of where we sit in the UK, where we come from. Uh, as I said, we're a tiny island and there's nearly 65 yeah. million of us on it. We need to make sure that we, we're balanced in, in our approach internationally. Yeah, Dawn, you're shaking your head there, nodding, nodding in agreement. No, yeah, absolutely. I, can, I couldn't agree with Kate more. I mean, my husband's family are from Manchester and I do find it astonishing that, you know, politicians in particular seem obsessed with London and the South East. And anything that happens outside of this area isn't that important. Oh, it's just the North or, or the South West also suffers in a similar vein, doesn't it? Oh, it's just, you know, it's Devon, Cornwall, no one really cares, just go on holiday. It's ludicrous. I mean, that we are, we are, as Kate quite rightly said, in 2021, still this divided. It's mad. Dawn, take us into the, the Telegraph and this story about the EU factory at the heart of the vaccine row. Yeah, talking of divides, Gillian, this one is even more interesting. This is the ongoing saga of the EU and the vaccination programme, or lack of it, especially in France at the moment. Um, this is um, it's a, it's a great telegraph exclusive, actually. British taxpayers have funded the EU factory at the heart of the vaccine round. This is a factory that is actually in, in Holland, in Leiden in Holland. And it was British taxpayers that literally um, have equipped the factory to produce doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, meanwhile, the EU haven't invested a penny, despite the scientists involved in this saying, look, this is going to work. We need this factory up and running. Um, you know, you need to invest in it as well. But they haven't. It's in Holland. Even the Dutch haven't invested in it. Um, and taxpayers, British taxpayers, um, really £21 million pounds is supposedly been invested in it. And a leaked letter has revealed all of this. Um, the factory should have um, been invested in last April by the EU. And the Euro European Union is saying now, despite that we have paid for it, that they are not going to let any vaccines produced at this factory come to the UK until Europe has been looked after. It's, it's just, it's a whole mess again, Gillian. And, you know, we know France now is going into another three-week lockdown and Macron is having all sorts of problems in France with, you know, the vaccine's safe, no, it's not safe, oh, you can do it, you can't do it. And, you know, and, and Germany and Holland are the same. And it's like, you know, the, the fact that people's lives are on the line here, you know, let's cut to the chase here. This is not about politics. This is about people's lives. And this factory is producing loads of vaccines that are going to be sort of like gridlocked because of politics. It, it's just utter madness. Okay, let's look at something completely different. This is a really interesting story about uh, Apple founder Steve Jobs and his uh, one of his early application forms for a job. There were two things I wanted to buy this week, Gillian, and I couldn't find the extra hundreds of thousands of pounds down the sofa. The first was the motel in the, I'm not actually, am I mean, allowed to say the programme's name? The programme that won all the Emmys, that is something Creek. They're selling the motel that was featured in that uh, big series. And the other thing is this letter. It's a huge sliding doors moment if you're a business geek like me. This is a handwritten application for a job. Um, by Steve Jobs, who was looking for a job in technology. Um, I, it was written in 1973 when he was just 18 years old. It's been sold at auction for £204,000. And um, I think it's the idea that if this job would have gone ahead, no one's quite sure whether he just didn't get the job oh. or he decided not to take the job. I was going to ask, actually, did he actually, get the job? Right, if he didn't get the job. He then went on to work at Atari with Stephen Wozniak and the two of them together founded this partnership, this inspiration, aspirational relationship that went on to then create Apple and Co. So I think it's just a fantastic piece of history. Yeah, very expensive though, £204,000 <laughs> for a piece of paper <laughs> the teenager's application on. Um, to the star and Dawn, tell us about emojis. What does it tell well, us about ourselves when we send them? Oh, that's yeah, a good exactly. one. Exactly. Um, if you ever do this as an emoji, yeah. you're in serious trouble because it, it means you're an old fogey. Um, <laughs> this is a, I, I know, tell me. Um, this is a survey, survey of 16 to 29 year olds who are dissing people's messaging skills. That's our messaging skills, basically, Julia, um, with emojis that are cool and emojis that aren't cool. Mm. Um, basically, if you, if you send the, the thumbs up, the heart or, or that, 
um, or the tick, or my, one of my favorites, which is the hand over the eyes one. I, I, I tend to use that one a lot. That means you're, you're, you're oh. old, you're past, really shouldn't use emojis. Um, however, um, the ones that are good, the aubergine one, you might not be shocked to hear, the peach the drooling face and the heart for eyes. The one that no one likes, no matter what age group, is the skull and crossbones. Right. I've never sent that one. I've never had the calls to, to send that one. Um, I'll stop sending the thumbs ups now. Uh, to the uh, Times, Kate, just very quickly, animals that have their own culture. Yes, so, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to admit I'm a huge part of the animal race, as we all are. And this is a chimpanzee in a study that a few years ago decided uh, Julie would stick a piece of grass in her ear. No one knows quite why. But then in her group, other chimpanzees started to stick a piece of grass in the ear too. And she would pick up, obviously the grass would fall off, so she'd pick, find another piece, stick it on her ear. So I, think, she was a I think the moral is chimpanzees or... can be beautiful as well. <laughs> Dawn and Kate, <laughs> thank you so much. See you in the next hour.